In this video, we will review the accusations brought against Pope Dioscoros and critique his condemnation. Metropolitan Gregorius Behnam of the Syriac Orthodox Church provides a nice analysis of some of the claims against Pope Dioscoros. First, he explains that the Council of Chalcedon made it seem like Pope Dioscoros was the one who asked for the Second Council of Ephesus and that he was using it for personal gain. This is of course untrue, and there is no evidence to support it. Pope Dioscoros did not ask for the council. He did not ask to lead the council, and he had nothing to gain from the council. This argument, however, can be made for Pope Leo and Chalcedon. We have surviving correspondence between Pope Leo and the emperor, in which he demands a new council, led by himself. With regards to Second Ephesus, Pope Dioscorus did not collude with the emperor. There was a theological controversy in Constantinople, and Pope Dioscorus went to the ecumenical council like any other bishop, simply seeking to resolve it. The council's decisions were achieved through voting, as is clear in the minutes. Unlike what Pope Leo claimed, the council was not in opposition to himself, but described him as a saint and spoke of him favorably. Emperor Theodosius supported the council. If the council had been of a questionable nature, he would not have done so. The emperor mentioned violence at the hands of Theodoret of Cyrus, Pope Leo's friend, so he should not have had a problem pointing out and condemning any violence committed by Pope Dioscoros at Second Ephesus. The last point is that until the last moment of Chalcedon, Pope Dioscoros did not speak an evil word against Rome, while Pope Leo in his epistles referred to the Pope of Alexandria as that Egyptian plunderer and preacher of the devil's errors who tried to force his villainous blasphemies on his brethren. With all of this in mind, let us begin to review the accusations brought against Pope Dioscoros. Pope Dioscoros was tried twice, once during the first session, where he was uncanonically deposed by the imperial commissioners, and a second time when the bishops actually tried him and deposed him in absentia at what is called the third session. When Bishop Pescasinus condemned Pope Dioscoros at the end of the third session, he stated that he was doing so on the following grounds. He claimed that Pope Dioscoros had allowed into communion Eutychus after his condemnation at the home synod, but before his restoration at second Ephesus. They also claimed that Pope Dioscoros had rebelled against the council, that he did not allow the tome of Pope Leo to be read at the Second Council of Ephesus, resulting in a great scandal in the church, that he had excommunicated Pope Leo, and finally, that he had refused three summons to the third session. When we first discussed these grounds, we briefly mentioned that none of them were substantiated by any evidence, except for the last. In this video, we will go a little deeper in our analysis and point out the flaws in the whole condemnation. There are at least two flaws regarding the council's decision against Pope Dioscoros. First, there was a great miscarriage of justice. Second, the accusations against Pope Dioscoros were unspecified. So, why would the case against Pope Dioscoros be categorized as a miscarriage of justice? According to the council, he was guilty of ignoring the council and not showing up for his own trial. But the question still stands, why was he even on trial? You see, he had already been condemned, deposed, and imprisoned in the first session. Although all of that was done uncanonically, it had still been done. So the question stood, why were they trying him for a second time? Was he on trial for new offenses not discussed in the first session? Well, in that case, the imperial commissioners and the whole council would have to attend to review the new charges. This was not the case. Only about 200 of the 370 bishops were attending the third session, and the imperial commission was not in attendance so no new accusations could be discussed. If they did try him for new accusations without the other bishops and the commission present, then they did not afford him due process. So what if he was being retried for the same accusations from the first session? That is called double jeopardy. He had already been condemned, deposed, and imprisoned on those charges. They couldn't try him for the same alleged crimes a second time. So if either option is true, we are still dealing with a miscarriage of justice. To summarize, Pope Dioscorus was condemned for not attending a trial that should not have taken place. The second flaw is that the accusations levied against Pope Dioscorus were unspecified. For starters, the list was ever-changing and ever-growing throughout the trial. The original list from the first session, the two sets of accusations from the third session, and the final list in the condemnation all differ greatly. These varied accusations were presented in an unfair manner and were not further investigated, but taken at face value. It seems that Pope Dioscorus himself was unsure of what exactly he was being tried for. The Council of Chalcedon was also keen on holding the canons to censor Pope Dioscorus, 
and prevent him from having a defense for not attending the session. However, this was the first time that such a thing had been done. At previous councils, when Paul of Samosata and Nestorius had been deposed and refused thrice summons, the writings were still read and analyzed, and a defense was provided on their behalf by the council, based on their writings. St. Dioscorus was not provided this defense or charity. The Roman legates jumped on the opportunity to censor him, to allow themselves the right to be vague in their condemnation. Finally, the condemnation references other offenses which Pope Dioscorus committed, but it never specifies what the offenses were. To demonstrate this vagueness and lack of evidence in the claims, let us analyze the first one. The Romans claimed that Pope Dioscorus had allowed Eutyches into communion following the home synod of Constantinople in 448, but before his reconciliation at 2nd Ephesus in 449. The term communion may mean many things. Did the claim mean friendship or fellowship and support? Or did the claim instead mean that someone in the diocese of Pope Dioscorus gave communion to Eutyches? Never once did the bishops raising these allegations provide a fact or evidence demonstrating that Eutyches had taken communion. An event or a day was never specified. The allegations were made broadly, without any facts or evidence. Even if Pope Dioscorus had allowed Eutyches to partake in Eucharistic fellowship after his condemnation, but before his restoration, Pope Leo was guilty of the same charge since he allowed Theodoret of Cyrus to be restored prior to Chalcedon. While there are facts and evidence demonstrating that Theodoret was restored, such as his attendance at Chalcedon, there are none demonstrating that St. Dioscorus had accepted Eutyches into Eucharistic fellowship. Now that we've analyzed the second condemnation of Pope Dioscorus and discovered that it is as bogus as the first one was, let us turn our attention to the man, the myth, the legend, Pope Leo himself, the reason that all of this was happening. For one reason or another, Pope Leo just didn't like Pope Dioscorus. We're not sure exactly why, but it may have had something to do with the influence that the patriarchs of Alexandria held in the East. They always led the ecumenical councils, and they always influenced theological debates. It could have also been influenced by personal motives, but we will never know. What we do know, however, is that when Pope Leo had sent out his tome, he sent a copy to almost all the bishops in the East, but not to Pope Dioscorus. It doesn't seem, however, from the actions and writings of Pope Dioscorus that he reciprocated this animosity. As we had mentioned previously, Pope Leo also saw Pope Dioscorus as both an obstacle and an opportunity to overturn the Second Council of Ephesus. Pope Dioscorus's influence would prevent him from overturning the council, but if he were to condemn Pope Dioscorus, the council's authority would come crumbling down. It is for this reason that the Council of Chalcedon was so hasty in condemning Pope Dioscorus at the first session. They wanted to depose him as quickly as possible to ensure that they had no opposition when the discussion of faith and formation of a creed came up. In their haste, however, they made some sloppy mistakes. As we know, a bishop can only be deposed by his peers. But in the first session, Pope Dioscorus and the five bishops who had led the Second Council of Ephesus with him were deposed by the Imperial Commission on the authority of the Emperor. It was clear that those charges would not stand. In fact, soon after the first session ended, rumors had began spreading that Pope Dioscorus would be reinstated soon. This triggered the council to post a notice denying the veracity of those rumors. This was the reason that a second trial, more authoritative than the first, had to be conducted fast. At the end of the first session, bishops were instructed to draw up confessions and submit them to the council in order to draw up a statement of faith. If Pope Dioscorus was not properly deposed quickly, he would still have the ability to submit his own confession, proving that he was not a heretic, and influencing the final decisions of the council. That's why the second trial had to happen fast. The other bishops who had been condemned with Pope Dioscorus would all be given an option. Continue to be condemned, or sign the Tome of Leo, and be reinstated. They all chose to sign, and were all officially reinstated in the fourth session of the council. With the condemnation of Pope Dioscorus now complete, Pope Leo was now free to redefine the Orthodox faith to better fit his tome.